Okay, again, so hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special evening with Seton Hall University alumnus Scott Chesney. Um, before we get started, I just want to share some reminders and notes about the next hour together. Uh, just a reminder, again, if you haven't already done so, we encourage you to have your username be your full name and class year, or your name and affiliation to Seton Hall. Um, we want to be able to give alumni who are not able to join us tonight the opportunity to participate in this experience as well, so today's session will be recorded. For this experience, it's best to have the speaker as your full screen in order to make sure you're in the right viewing mode. You should see in the right-hand corner the words gallery view. Please note we encourage you to ask questions, so if you have a question, please use the chat feature on your screen and we'll get to that um, at the end of our program. And then if you need any assistance during the presentation tonight, please use the chat feature on the right sidebar and someone from the university will reach out to you in a private chat. Known as the commander in change by his clients, Scott Chesney is a navigator of life with paralysis for 35 years. After awakening to paralysis at 15 from a sudden spinal stroke, Scott has amassed a resume of tr transformational experiences, powerful insights and inspiring stories that cut to the human spirit. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight, Mr. Scott Chesney. We're now gonna share with you the trailer to his documentary, Wide, Ride the Wave. How are we doing, bud? Hey, good to see you. I feel like you are an influencer, but not only me, but for the world. It's good if we could be self-motivated, self-inspired by what it is that we do. There is a blueprint inside of us. There is access to strength beyond our wildest dreams. Scott was my dream for what I couldn't accomplish in sports. I knew he had every ability too. Scott was a real deal. You know, he was the quarterback of the football team, the shortstop and pitcher on the baseball team. You could see he was going to be a, he was going to be a very good athlete, very good athlete. December 28, 1985, I remember waking up and just having a numb big toe. And then that numbness went up one leg, went up a second leg and left me paralyzed. And they diagnosed it as foie à la genie. Just like to wake up that way. He went to bed. Scott went to bed. It was clear that he had some gifts, the gift of communication, the gift of inspiration. He's using whatever tools he's been given to influence our society in a positive way. Nothing's impossible for him. Like, he can always do what he wants, just keep on believing. That's what he says every day. There's a little peak out front and then one further south that way. So we're trying to stay in this little general area right here. He wants to do the, the, um, the Para Surf world, world Games next year. And it's my job to get him ready for it. I think Scott can win it. That's Scott, and that's how I identify him. Like, the ocean is Scott. That's his happy place. I can't change what happened on December 20th, 1985. I can't. The best thing that I can do is move forward. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie and your wonderful team, Sean and Meredith and everyone at Seton Hall University for having me here today. It's always a pleasure to come back to the hall. And I love it during this month of April. You have an annual day of giving, uh, the 20th and 21st. So to be a part of such a, uh, a proud month, uh, I think every month is uh, a reason to be proud and uh, to be prideful of what it is that we've achieved at Seton Hall University and what we want others to achieve. So um, thank the entire Seton Hall community. For, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I hope you had a chance to ride the wave. If you did, there's been some people who are still riding the wave and watching it a few times. There's people around the world who are watching it as we speak. If you didn't get a chance to ride the wave, why not? We're during a pandemic. You're at home. You got a TV. You got a computer. There's no reason why. I'm just kidding. But there's always going to be an opportunity for you to ride the wave. And I think through Seton Hall, and we could we could talk about this later on, is that there's going to be an opportunity actually for the remainder of the week up until um, Sunday, I believe, for you to have a chance to uh, ride the wave. So um, again, it's it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Now, um, I, I want to give you a little spoiler alert. Uh, for those of you that uh, watched the movie, yeah, um, 
you're going to know about this, who, who didn't know, uh, who didn't watch the movie, uh, you're going to learn that I, I broke my leg about four or five years ago. And you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, he's been paralyzed for 35 plus years and he broke his leg too? What's wrong with him? Does it like he have a mental disability too? Just stop it. Stop doing all this stuff to your body. Well, the truth of the matter is, as you can tell, is that I am an avid surfer, uh, adaptive surfer. And about four or five years ago is that I went out there in Bradley Beach, New Jersey. So I'm hoping we have a lot of Jersey folks on. I'm sure we have alumni on here. I have friends and people I've invited, whoever's on here. We all have a connection to Seton Hall. But I'm hoping that we all have a connection, too, in some way, uh, to the ocean. And uh, for me, it's the Jersey Shore. And I will tell you this is that so five years ago it was the day before Father's Day. And the ocean was still very cold. My, my team loved to take me out there. And uh, I remember on this day having a thick wetsuit on and the uh, waves were a little choppy. So we weren't quite sure how we were going to do, but we said, let's go out there and give it a shot. I got on that first wave and I'm riding it. And all of a sudden it was overtaken by another wave because it was choppy. And I remember it taking me off my board. So I wiped out, which had happened before. But on this time, and if you've ever been in the ocean, maybe you've experienced this as a little kid or as an adult, in which you almost felt like you were in a washing machine or a dryer in which you went head over heels, head over heels, and you kind of like maybe in this much water, but you, you just don't know which way is up. And so that happened to me, but unfortunately, it happened two or three times with my head and my legs going up and down three times. And so what would happen is that I would come to the surface and I'm able to float on my back and I'm able to swim and my legs float and rise to the top. But on this day, when I went to bring my legs and gather them, I saw that my right leg was at an angle it had never been before. I would find out hours later that I broke my femur, the biggest bone in your body, in six different spots. And so they carried me out gently. They put me in this beach chair right as the surf was going to come up. My leg was out straight, but I was just holding it. And they said, Scott, my, my team around me, eight, nine guys, they said, Scott, what do you want to do? Now, I, we can get a helicopter to come in here and pick you up. We can get an ambulance. But what do you want to do? I said, guys, I, I just need a moment. And I, I just remember my head being down and trying to hold my leg straight, but something was calling me to pick my head up. And I remember lifting my head up and looking out into the ocean and seeing a beautiful wave form, unlike a, any other wave I'd seen before. And then another wave beyond that was forming. And then another wave beyond that. And while I was angry, I was sad, probably in some kind of shock, is that I had that moment of peace. And this moment of peace basically said, there's another wave that's going to be waiting for you when this is healed. There's actually another wave after that. And while I'm talking about the ocean now, it was so crystal clear that it had to do so much more than just the ocean. It has to do with life. So tonight, I want to talk to you about these challenging times we're experiencing. I want to talk to you about resilience. I want to talk to you about that next wave that's absolutely waiting for you right now. Because I say, you know what, each and every day provides us with another moment to say, this is going to be the first day of my life. And why? Because I so choose. So I had that moment of peace. And I realized that in any type of adversity, it doesn't take away from the pain. Great quote says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. I hate saying that because I know that bothers a lot of people. But we do have a choice. And we do have a choice as to how we want to manage these turbulent times. I love to think of these turbulent times. Now, some of you may have experienced a, a hurricane before. If not, you probably studied it in school, maybe at the great school of Seton Hall University. But if you've ever witnessed a hurricane before, you have like obviously all this rain, all this wind that's going on, all this turbulence, but inside, and even if you're like a, a Jim Cantori fan and watching the Weather Channel, you'll know that there's an eye of the storm. And in that eye of the storm is that there's a peacefulness. There's a tranquility. You don't even realize that there's a storm around you. And I'm letting you know is that we have, again, not the weather, not waves, but our lives are like that as well. So I'm not saying that we're going to get rid of these turbulent times that are going on around us. It's going to rain. It's going to shower. It's going to be full of uh, gale force winds. But I'm letting you know that there's always that place that you could come to. That place within. That place that's home where we feel grounded. And we can ground ourselves 
We can put ourselves back in the moment. We can do what we need to do to care for ourselves so that we can better navigate. So we can go out there if we need to hit the gas and accelerate a little bit more. If we need to hit that pause button and just observe what's going on, we have the ability to do this. So a lot of what I've always talked about over the years, but I'm realizing more than ever, is that the more that you get to know yourself, the more that you care for yourself, the more that you can understand and care for others. Now, I'm going to have some people on this call because I always have those people and say, what is he talking about? Where's my leave button? I got to get off this Zoom call. Like, what, doing for himself, how selfish could this guy be? Now, folks, when you do for yourself, at the exclusion of other people, I'm in full agreement with you. That is selfishness. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about caring for yourself, getting to know yourself so well that you get to know others and can do even more for other people. That's self-respect. I'll even take it one step further because I've experienced the bliss of self-love as well. And that's the journey. That's never, it's not like, wow, I've arrived at this place. No, you'll arrive at that place. What you'll realize is that there's so much growth. And rather than saying, I have to learn more, you'll be in a place of saying, what's next? What do I uncover next? You're telling me there's an opportunity for more growth? And I'm going to say, yeah, absolutely. So it's appreciating where you are. And tonight's all about gratitude as well. But it's realizing that there's always another level. I'm finding a lot of people, and understandably so, who are so stressed out right now, who are so full of tension, and understandably so. But I realize is that where all that stress and tension is building up is that they're not caring for themselves. So I will find, and I'll give you an example in a moment, I'm finding people who love doing for other people, who are servants to other people, who are basically dedicating their lives to other people who are burned out and stressed, you might say, well, what's missing? Folks, they're not caring for themselves. They're the last person. If I have time at the end of the day, maybe, just maybe I'll take care of myself. And I'm letting you know, while that's admirable and heroic, it's almost like when you get on an airplane. And I know it's been a while since many people have been on an airplane. But if you remember when you're given those procedures in case of an emergency, is that they don't say give that oxygen to that cute little kid who's sitting next to you first. No, they're not even saying give it to that elderly person on the other side of you. They say give it to yourself first so then you can give it to other people. Now, if you're still in doubt and disbelief about this, because I love this, I love a good challenge. And if you're out there saying, nah, I'm still not buying this, I have an example for you. See, I'm one of those people that when I hear about success, when I hear about happiness, when I hear about people really taking care of others, yet having so much energy still at the end of each day, then I want to study them. Then I want to learn from them because it's not just me in this world. It's about all of us. And I try to take away those messages from those people. And so I did a little research on someone who I think we all can agree was one extraordinary person. Now, this could have everything to do with religion or nothing to do with religion. But I have yet to find a people around the world where I've traveled who have said, you know what? Mother Teresa was really not a nice person. And she didn't do a lot for other people. I've yet to find anyone that that's, that's, uh, speaks negatively about her. Conversely, it's almost like, wow, she was a servant. She constantly did for other people. Now, I found out. I did so much research into Mother Teresa. I wanted to find out what made her tick. And I found out that at some point in her life, she committed to one morning. She committed each and every morning, one hour, in which she said, wow, this is my time to pray. This is my time to pray by myself. It's my time to talk to God. One hour by herself each and every day before the day came, before this huge agenda started in which she would help countless people. And then when I found out on the other side of the day, before her head hit the pillow, she would spend one hour in silence. She said, this is my meditation time. This is my time to listen to God. So I like to think, and maybe she sprinkled her life with even more gratitude throughout the day based on the lives that she met, but she was filling her own cup on either side of the day to the point where she had so many resources to help other people. 
so many resources to uh, help other people. So folks, they, they, more than anything tonight, I want you to really examine your own lives and realizing, you know what, a great life, be an appreciation for where you are, but know that great life can get even greater. If you're in a place of, you know, it's the status quo. And I'm just kind of going through the motions right now. I appreciate your honesty. But through this power to choose that I'm going to talk about in a minute comes the power to change. You can say, I don't want to be stagnant anymore. I don't want to just be coasting. I don't want a good life. I want a great life. And then there are going to be some people who are absolutely struggling right now. And my heart goes out to you. But I also say to you, with the power to choose comes the power to change. And why not make it now? Love acronyms. Now. No other way. And you might be in that place right now that, you know, I can't continue with my life this way. It's just draining my energy. My happiness is out the window, whatever it may be. Today. Today could be the first day of your life for one reason and one reason only. Because you so choose. So I want to give you some simple tips. Some simple things that you can do starting today that I personally want to guarantee you. You guys can all find me. You can call Jamie. You can find me wherever you want if this stuff doesn't work. But I'm letting you know, this really works. Now, I just mentioned before how I really want you to start today. And that's with gratitude. That's before you get out of that bed. That's when your eyes first open. That's when that mind of yours starts going to an agenda. And I want to let you know, before you go up here, go into your heart. The mind thinks the heart knows. I want you to go into your knowingness. And I want you to flood your life real quick with gratitude. What are you grateful for in that moment? How about the gift of life? You're awake. I believe you're still alive. How about that house that you have? How about those simple things around you? How about the opportunity to go in a different direction in my personal life? Go in a different direction, maybe in my professional life. So flood your life. And I say flood, my lucky number is 12. I love to begin the day with 12 things for which I am grateful. And then after that, I shift into attitude mode. See, I believe that, you know what? There's a battle that's going on. And I know this battle is strong, especially for this past year right now. And there's a lot of battles that we've lost because of this pandemic. But I'm telling you right now, we will win this war. And I want to let you know is that this attitude thing, we talk about attitude adjustments. This is our energy, folks. This is where we decide no matter what's going on out there, how I am going to begin my day. Now, I like to think so. It's been over 35 years now that I have awakened each and every day to this thing called gratitude and then to this thing called the waiting wheelchair. See, I have my wheelchair waiting next to me, but I'm in the same place you are in which, hmm, how am I going to make my day work? Where am I going to take my day? Am I going to elevate it or am I going down on the elevator? Whatever it may be, I'm constantly looking to raise the bar. And so every day when I see that wheelchair, to me, it's like, hmm, get in that wheelchair because that's showing up for life. That's half the battle. There's only one thing that's getting me in that wheelchair each and every day and has gotten me in that wheelchair each and every day. And that's my attitude. So when I get in that attitude, hmm, I'm showing up for life. That's half the battle. The second half of the battle, folks, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, what our greatest power is as human beings. Now, again, I've had a chance to do a lot of traveling, to meet a lot of extraordinary people, to meet people who are way up here and are thriving in their lives, and people who are really struggling down here and trying to see their differences, realizing that we all can go up there if we want, but we're all going to go down there from time to time. And so I, in my research, in my studying other people, in talking to other people, I realized that everything funnels down to this power to choose, ladies and gentlemen. Our power to choose, even what type of attitude you're going to have, that is your choice. Now, for those of you that might be in question of that, I lean towards another favorite quote of mine from the late Maya Angelou, who's a great humanitarian, great poet, great author, great speaker, dynamic human being. She says, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude, don't complain. 
So I love that. So even if you're in a place of wondering, you know what? Well, I, I just don't feel that I, I, I have this power to choose right now. And on a side note right now, I have to tell you, and you got to own it if you're out there. I don't know how many people since this pandemic started saying, wow, I feel so paralyzed. Really? Really? Let me, let me share with you what paralysis is, folks, and everything. And, and, and I can't even talk so much about it because I got friends who don't have the use of their hands or use of their arms. But paralysis? Really paralyzed? Um, I, and I say that in laughter. I can understand with all the confinement and all the things that have changed and all the limitations that have been placed on us. And that's why I feel like in many ways that living with a disability, and I've talked to my extended brothers and sisters with mobility disabilities, and we kind of get that same little smile on our face. It's almost like our disabilities have prepared us for this pandemic because we're used to living with less. We're used to pivoting and navigating differently. We're used to having like, hmm, to shift directions and go in that direction rather than that one. We've gotten used to that in a way. So this power to choose, I believe that everything boils down to that. And if you arrive at that point where you don't feel you have your power to choose, how can I elevate my attitude to look at this differently? Now, folks, we, we talked about gratitude before. You could give me such a long list of all the negative things that are associated. Now, I'm just focusing on this pandemic, but we, we can talk about any type of adversity. But is that there are so many blessings in disguise. There's so many things that if you really took a look at it, that you've learned about yourself, that I don't know if given any other circumstances, you would have learned as much as you have during this pandemic. There's been things that you've learned about other people. Folks, I am convinced that in any type of adversity, any type of adversity, there are blessings in disguise. And so we need to make a choice. We need to make a choice to look at it that way. Now, when I think of this power to choose, I think of this person who's behind me. You see the great Nelson Mandela, known to his people as Madiba. Madiba. Now, I had a chance to see him speak live. Didn't have a chance to meet him in person. Had a chance to meet his holiness in person, which uh, the Dalai Lama, which was fantastic. He was on my list too, but did not make it happen, but felt like I was in his energy. But I was also given a tour of his prison cell on Robben Island by somebody who was an inmate at the same time he was for a period of time that Nelson Mandela was. And he took us around, took us inside this prison cell that you see here. And he asked me, he said, Scott, do you know what happened when he was first released from prison? And I said, no, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And they said they had a big press conference. And the first question that was asked of Madiba, Nelson Mandela, was, Mr. Mandela, how did you ever survive 27 years in prison? With a great big smile on his face, he said, I wasn't surviving, I was preparing. In which when I still echo those words, I get like goosebumps because I'm like, wow, can you imagine? I mean, here I am confined to a wheelchair for 35 plus years, but I can't even relate to that. I can't even relate to that in which he's in a prison cell, let out, yes, during the course of the day, but somewhat confined, can't leave there for 27 years. And everyone would say, you have every single right, every single permission to say, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be alive anymore. But he chose to focus on this movement that he had started to bring people of all walks, all colors and creeds together. And I like to think of it almost like taking a stone and throwing it into a still pond and watching the ripple effect on that rest of the pond. And he had a chance to do that. And so his message that he had before he went into prison grew in his confinement to the point where he got out. Wow, was there such a movement that is still in full force today. But it lets me know that, wow, when you have that power to choose, the power to choose what type of attitude you're going to have. The power to choose what your beliefs are going to be. The choice to say, hmm, I want a better life for myself. I want a better life for other people. Think about it, folks, is that all these titles that you have in your life, son, daughter, sister, brother, student, business worker, friend, uh, wife, husband, whatever it may be, 
is that you have the power to choose how you're going to be in all these areas of your life. Now, I, I will tell you this, is that um, wh when I think of power to choose as well, I think of an old story. And I, I had to bring one of my stories from Seton Hall University back into the fold. This is when I was actually a senior. So we're going back 1991, 1992. I am really aging myself here. So when I do this, I remember there being an internship. So I was in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I remember Professor Reeder at the time, and he might still be there, but Professor Reeder uh, put up on a bulletin board that there was going to be an internship. And it was going to be being an engineer for a radio show. Now, I actually worked at WSOU Pirate Radio as assistant sports director. Um, got used to the music, didn't love the music, but grew to love the music. But there was an opportunity outside of WSOU, somewhere nearby in South Orange, New Jersey, to engineer a show. And I was like, wow, this is great. So I approached Professor Reader, actually ripped it off the board so no one else could see it. And I brought it into his, and put it right on his desk. I said, Professor Reader, I want to go for this. And he looked at me, he said, Scott, I, I would love to kind of like offer this up to you, but I don't think it's going to work. And I said, why? And he said, Scott, this is at a house nearby in South Orange. And you know the way the architecture is in South Orange. You have all these steps and then a little platform. And then you go inside the house and then there are more steps when you get inside. Much older homes than they are today. And I said, I'm game if you are. Let's go. So he set up an appointment. I said, do not tell this person. Her name is Adrienne Bird. She was actually a television, uh, 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 I'm sorry, a radio show host for WABC Radio. And she said, uh, I said, don't tell her when you call, just say, listen, I have someone who's interested in the position. He came with me and all of a sudden we got to the house and there were four or five stairs going up to the landing just to get to the front door. And he said, Scott, I told you. And I said, sit back. So I remember transferring with my arms and my hands onto the first step and pushing myself up to the top step, step and then leaning down and bringing my wheelchair up each step putting it on there and with my arms in my hands, transferring up and into that wheelchair, rang the doorbell, Adrian Berg came and she said, hello. And I said, hello, Ms. Berg, I'm Scott Chesney. I'm here for the internship. She said, how did you get up here? I was like, my arms and my hands, I just brought my chair up. And Professor Reader is down at the bottom of the stairs going like this and nodding his head. She's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah. She looked at Professor Reader and she said, I don't need to interview anybody else. I want him. Now, through all these choices that I made, it was quite interesting because when I got in the house, there was another huge flight of stairs leading to her bedroom where I was going to be the engineer for a morning radio show and in one arm, hold a, a, a newborn baby, have the like uh, headset on my ear, telling her when to go to commercials, also having a microphone to talk about what it's like to hold this baby or anything else in my life. When I tell you, I had no idea where things were coming from, and it was awesome. And why I share that is because it's, it's lined. The story is lined with challenge after challenge after challenge. And I don't know how you look at challenges, but I'm one of those people that you put a challenge in front of me. I'm just not like, ah, another one? How am I going to navigate through this? No, I'm not like that. You know what I'm more concerned about? What's waiting for me on the other side of this challenge? Because whatever it is, I'm going around you, I'm going under you, I'm going over you. And if I'm strong enough, I'm going through you. There is nothing that's going to prevent me and getting what I want. And if there is, happens to be something. Now, not everything happens, folks. Not all of my goals and dreams have come true. But I will tell you this, those that have not, it's not from my lack of effort. It's not on anyone else's terms. It's not saying, you know what, Scott, you can't do this. Just keep telling me I can't do something. I'm going to do it just to spite you. I may arrive at that place on my own, but that's where I need to arrive. That's where you need to arrive. Folks, there's a lot of people who mean well and are going to tell you things that you're not capable of doing, things that you absolutely can't get done. But I am going to tell you this, is that I was told that I'd never be able to father my own children, something that was more important to me than walking again. I was told that I had a 2% chance and the longer that I was paralyzed and in a wheelchair. And I won't get into the story, but through a lot of traveling, a lot of soul searching, tapping into, making the choice to tap into this power of belief, 
I found that this was more important to me than walking again. I'd be blessed if I could adopt a child. It's still something my wife and I talk about doing, but I wanted to have my own child. And so I kept digging deeper and realizing that this is what I want. I got home and I was retested and I was told I had a 55% chance of fathering my own children. And a doc looked at me, he goes, what have you been doing? And so he goes, you've just defied research. That's a method of the mind, folks. I'm not a statistic. You've just defied logic. What's logic, especially in this world today? He said, what have you been doing? I, said, I tapped the center of my chest and I said, doc, there's something that's unquantifiable and something that cannot be measured. And it doesn't exist within some of us. It exists within all of us. And that's the power of belief. Folks, if you make the choice to put the power of belief behind anything, beginning with a belief in yourself, okay, I don't want you to be held a prisoner anymore. We hold ourselves to such high standards, yet we don't hold some people to standards. We're like, that's beautiful. That's amazing. That's great. Yet when someone uses those words to describe us, we're like, who, me? Yeah, you. As all these compliments and all these positive words and all these choices that you use for words to describe other people, that's you too. Everyone's a mere reflection of you in some way. To be learned, to learn from, and they're supposed to be learning from you as well. Now, folks, with this power to choose, I want to give you some just some quick tips because I, I, I'm not going to talk for the whole time. I mean, I, I will answer some questions in a while, so we will get around to those. But I, I want to give you some solid tips that if you apply in your life, wow, you will notice immediate results. Now, folks, I want tonight to be motivational. I want it to be inspirational. But I know all too well, motivation, inspiration can be here today and gone tomorrow. I need to give you some action steps so you could put it into play. Here you go. Is that, <laughs> what could I be doing more of? What could I be doing less of? And what can I be doing that's new? So I want you to not only ask those three questions, I want you to answer them great answers within ourselves there's these answers are waiting within you trust me but so ask the question answer it but then act on the answer that's where we come up short folks is that we don't take action and i'm not saying that everything's going to work out but you are going to be moving out of your comfort zone the moment that you say hmm i want to act on this wonderful answer that i just got so the more of what is it professionally and personally that you want to make a choice of exploring right now. It's not about the excuses why it's not getting done. No, I'm tired of those. Start doing this now. What do I need to be doing less of? I'll give you a quick example. How many people have iPhones out there? How many times were the, the, the first time you saw screen time pop up on there? How many of you dropped this phone, maybe broke your phone because you're like, whoa, folks, a half an hour less each and every day, an hour less, whatever it takes is that we got to get off these phones. I am one who is addicted to this thing and I don't like it. Wow, was that a client who just reached out to me? Wow, is there an opportunity that I, I can speak um, somewhere? Oh, wow, look at that. I can, I can create every excuse in the world to be on this thing. But it's interesting. Less of this opens me up to do more of what? Maybe it's going outside a little bit more. Maybe it's exercising more. Maybe it's making a commitment to a healthier diet. Maybe it's spending more time with loved ones. Maybe it's just being. Folks, last time I checked, we're not human doings. We're human beings. So sometimes just being is very productive and what we need for ourselves. Um, more of, less of, and new. The reason I bring up the word new is that that's variety. One of our basic human needs as human beings is our need for variety. So when we that might require a little bit more thinking, but getting around to something new that we could be doing with our lives. Folks, I have coaching clients who are driving a different way to work. I have other coaching clients who are listening to different music on the way home. Just anything to mix up the same old grind, the same old routine. We have the opportunity to do this. Now, folks, I do want to get to the Q&A, but I am going to, I began this and I'm going to end this with gratitude. And so, whereas I want you to start the day and end the day with gratitude, I want you to join me in a pledge that I took, I'm going to say a good decade ago. 
in which I said, no more, no more bad days. I am not going to have another bad day as long as I live. Oh, am I going to have challenging moments? Oh, I have a lot of challenging moments. I have moments each and every day that are full of sadness. I have moments each and every day that are filled with pain. I have moments every day that is filled with failure. All of these give me an opportunity to learn more about myself and other people. But because of this thing called gratitude, I will not allow myself to have another day in which I said that was a bad day. So again, if you're beginning your day and ending your day with gratitude, no matter what was filled in the middle, but I think there's going to be moments too. So there's not one experience. And maybe that could be someone, someone put out there. There can't, you can't give me one experience in which I would say to you that there's not some type of blessing in disguise. There's not something. See, I believe that every single choice, every single experience, every single failure, every single success, every single pleasure, pleasurable experience, every single painful experience, all of those have led me up to this moment in which I'm sharing with you, doing what I love. So for me, there's a part of me that says any other choice, any other experience, any other event that may have evolved in my life, I might not be here today sharing it with you what it is that I love. So again, it's not that straight line that says, wow, this has just been a beautiful tra trajectory. I think I said that right. No, it's a zigzag line. It's like a little kid scribbling on a piece of paper in my life. And your life is the same. And the thing is, is that no one's life is ever going to look the same as yours. But the, bo the bottom line is, it's a beautiful line. And it's wonderful. And I do believe that through different choices, yeah, we can make that go up a little bit more. We can make that go up a little bit more. So folks, I, I, I'm extremely grateful for being with you tonight. One last thing before I do open up to the, the q and I'm finding this all too much with my audiences, with my coaching clients, and in my own life, is that I need to be in the moment more. I need to be in the moment more. I realize that when my energy is being drained, is that I'm probably dwelling on something in the past of which I can't change, can't change anything from your past, but you can reinterpret it. And you can reinterpret to say, without that experience, without meeting this person, without this failed relationship, without this loss of a job, whatever it may be, all of that, okay, helps me to make peace with the past. So either if you find yourself losing energy and you're spending too much time in the past, you can't change that, but you can reinterpret it. And also with the future, I'm all about planning. I'm also having a strategy. I'm all like wanting to plan out the future, but you have no control over that. I'm finding so many people filled with anxiety, anxiety and fear, fear of what it is that's down there. No, folks, no. We have no control over that plan all you want, but you can't spend too much time there either. If you're too much in the past, too much in the future, you're missing out on this moment. This is where we have the ability to connect with ourselves or with other people. This is where we have experiences, folks. And I'm hoping, just hoping tonight that this was an experience that we had that on some level you were going to replay in that beautiful mind of yours, but more importantly, this beautiful heart of yours. And hopefully it's going to change your life for the better. So with that being said, I think what we're going to do, whether it be in the chats, right? Um, Jamie, we're going to open it up to some questions and there might be some already. Yeah, so we do have one. So um, Meredith asked, at the age of 15, you know, you woke up and had your life going in one direction. So then how long did it change, take for you to change your mindset to be where you're at now with everything? Uh, it's a, a wonderful question. And I, I know that there's these stages of grief that people talk about. And I do believe in all those stages. But the thing is, is that not necessarily do they go in that order or um, they go in a certain period of time. So you would think that a 15-year-old kid whose life was all about movement is that I, I got sad, I got angry, I got depressed. No, that all hit me about 12 years later. And you're like, 
wait a minute, I don't understand. See folks, what, what I've done, so in that moment, I thought I was sick. See, I didn't have an accident. I didn't have an injury. I didn't have any kind of trauma. So I thought like, okay, this is a lot of awesome attention that I'm getting right now. Getting a lot of meals, getting a lot of people visiting me, getting uh, autographs from celebrities around the world. This isn't too bad. Um, but I realized is that whatever we don't deal with is that we put in this imaginary backpack behind us and it's going to weigh us down. And there's never a wrong time to go into that backpack. So what I realized 12 years later, I rewound the tape of my life. And I was like, why didn't that 15 year old kid get angry and upset, depressed? He had every right to feel all those things. And so I took myself back. And I remember being in that hospital bed and looking out and seeing, beginning with my mother and my father and my brother's eyeballs that were the size of golf balls filled with tears. Every single relative, every single friend who came to see me, same shape eyes with tears in them. And I know not consciously, but subconsciously, I said, all that pain you're all experiencing, huh, I can't take it. That pain is worse than any pain that I can experience. So everything that I maybe had every right to feel, I shut it down. And I shut it down quickly because there was a part of me that said, I have to let people know that I'm okay. I have to let people know that I'm courageous that I can move forward. And I remember putting a smile on my face. Again, this wasn't all done consciously. This was a subconscious at work. And I put a smile on my face and I almost like that athlete within me just kind of uh, awakened to say that every single physical therapy session, every single test that I went through is kind of preparing me for the, the biggest game of all. And that's re-entering life. And so, um, but I realized again, there's never a wrong time to go back to the drawing board reinterpret something that might be confusing, make peace with it. And the moment I did that is that the moment that backpack got a little bit lighter. Now I've done that with a lot of other issues in my life and then it gets a little heavier from time to time, but I will realize is that that's got nothing to do with the future or anything. That's got something to do with my past that's unresolved and maybe there's another layer that I need to be exploring. Great question. Great. So uh, Rich asked, what are some of the most powerful lessons you have learned in the recent past that you didn't know in the early stages of your paralysis? Wow. Some of the, oh. I, I'm realizing more, um, and, and it's probably the, one of the biggest issues for me is that um, still layers and layers of like making peace with my body with my paralyzed body. Again, you gotta remember I was 15 years old, uh, a 15 year old kid getting ready to step into his manhood and like whatever the case was like that never happened. And, and there's still a part of me and, um, and I don't know who said it. <laughs> there's a great quote, it said, uh, why not love your body? You've been sleeping with it your whole life. <laughs> I don't know if I could say that in a Catholic university. I, I think I've said worse at Seton Hall, but there's so many more layers of um, love for myself in general, but love for my body that I need to be at a place and realize that, you know what, uh, I want to get to a place of an unconditional love. And while it doesn't respond to my every command and it hasn't for 35 years, this is still my body beaten and bruised in many ways. But you know what, it still gets me with the help of a wheelchair from all the amazing experiences I've had in my life. So that's what I need to uh, go to another layer of making peace with. That's great. So Rich also asked, um, if you meditate, can you share some of the ways you feel this can benefit all of us? <laughs> Medi well, meditation, let, let me just, <laughs> it, I'm taking myself back to Seton Hall right now. So back in the 90s and everything, if you asked me, as a college kid to meditate, I would have pointed to the door and I would have said, get out. I would have thought that there was somebody probably dressed in like an orange jumpsuit like this, who was sitting on top of a mountain in India going, oh, and I wanted nothing to do with it. I realize now those things that I am so resistant to, even trying, and I don't mean things that like are unhealthy for you. I'm not talking about that. But meditation was on that list of something that I had put off for the longest time. And then I just surrendered and I at least tried it. 
And I'll never forget, I was actually in La Jolla, California, when I first uh, learned how to meditate. And with the, the great, he's a great author and a great doctor as well, Dr. Deepak Chopra uh, taught me how to meditate. And so I'd gotten out of my chair, I'm laying on the ground. He had me do a certain mantra, I'm taking some deep breaths and going into a meditation. And all of a sudden, like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And then in the next moment, I thought it was the next moment, I feel a little like tug at my shoulder. And I'm hearing Scott. Scott, wake up, wake up. And I like shook my head. It was an hour and a half later. We were supposed to be doing a 20 minute meditation. I fell asleep for an hour and a half and I was like, oh, Dr. Chopra, I am so sorry. I was like, oh, all your time and effort. And he said, Scott, first rule, never judge a meditation. You were supposed to be sleeping. You needed sleep more than you were supposed to be meditating. He said, if two weeks from now after training, you're still sleeping, more than meditate, then we have a problem. <laughs> but I will tell you, and this, there isn't even a close number two, is that um, when I need to disconnect from this wonderful world, when I need to recharge my battery, when I need to distance myself from these constant thoughts that are coming in at all angles, there is no close number two that helps me like meditation. So if you're one of those people who are just like, I hear so many people these days, I can't, I can't. Honestly, yeah, you haven't tried and you might be trying too hard, almost like Dr. Chopra would say, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling, give it a different chance, give it a chance. There's so many different types of meditation. And if it's something that allows you to relax, see, that's the thing about meditation. I think that scares people too. And in no judgment of other people, but it's not like a, a movement or an activity. It's something where you're kind of like stillness and silence. Like, no, people are like, that's not productive. Whereas my whole life before meditation was the polar opposite. It was movement and it was speaking. And while I still do a lot of speaking and I still do a lot of movement, I realized that those do so much better because I've embraced their polar opposites in stillness and silence. So I always tell people is that, you know, how would we know pleasure if we didn't know pain? How would we know success if we don't know failure? Now, I'm not telling you to go out and fail. That's not what I'm saying. It will find you. It already has. But that will make you appreciate your successes more. But there's something, and I might be generalizing here, but I do believe, and I like, especially here in America, is that there is so much that we need to learn um, about stillness and silence in our lives that can elevate our movement and elevate the noise that we like to make in whatever form it may be. Well, awesome. So uh, Rich wanted to say thank you for being such an amazing man and inspiration to so many as well. So thank you, Rich. Thank you so much. So I have a question. Um, you talked about the routines and changing that up. Um, and I think that that's like a really great thought to have in this world that we're living in. Um, so what are, I know you mentioned some, what are little things we can change in our daily routine to kind of make it just that slight difference to kind of make a day feel different than the next right now when we don't know what day it is half the time or, you know, we're sitting home all day in our same spot and things like that. It's a great question, Jamie. I, I like to have people accumulate wins. We all love to win. Whatever it may be, whether it's our team won in the basketball game, um, whether we won something like at work, we all we loved it as kids. We love it as adults now. And so the more wins that I'm finding and the, the little things, and this kind of connects with gratitude as well, the more wins, like I will say, getting in that wheelchair was a win. Um, looking into that mirror. So I haven't shared this with many audiences, but it's getting back to like deepening my relationship with my body. I have uh, a full length mirror now in my room. And so almost like, and I'm going to be dating myself, uh, Arthur Fonzarelli, the Fonz used to go, hey, and used to look into the mirror. I look in the mirror now and I give it one of these and I look at myself. That's a win. See, my dogs are barking upstairs. They know that's a win when I do that. When I play with my dogs, when I, I've taught my dogs like how to like ring a bell that when they need to go out and every time that they do that and I'm here working at home and I let them out, that's a win. When I've made a choice to eat healthier at a meal, that's a win. 
when I've connected, when I, because I'm one of those people that says, you know what, yeah, let, let's talk soon, let's do this. And like, I won't get around to it. But when I schedule it and I do it, that's a win. So it's almost like all these little things that um, we accumulate during the day. I think it's huge once we say that's a win. And, and when we kind of honor ourselves. And what I love about this is that it's contagious. Like my family, I have two teenage kids is that they see it. And I know my wife and the other people is like, what ends up happening, and this is part of our purpose too, is that it's not always like lecturing people and say, you got to do this, you got to make this happen. Because if you're not in that place of wanting to receive that type of teaching or whatever, you might be resistant to it. But when you lead by example, um, I, I love leaders in the world, but the, the ones that I love most who are leading by example, who are almost like magnets for other people. Like I'll, I'll do this with like fathers sometimes. I'll see fathers and I'll be like, wow, look at that connection. Like I want to broaden my connection with my son and my daughter. I'll invite that person to like coffee or like have a coffee or something. And we'll get together and we'll talk about it. Is that it, it, it's, it's about constant and, and never ending growth and, and, and improvement, but appreciating where we are first and realizing all that. So no, did I answer that question? I'm not sure. <laughs> needs it. <laughs> Definitely. That was great. So then Maureen asked, um, what advice do you have for someone who wants change, but doesn't know where to exactly find their purpose and passion? Oh, I love that. So, and that's great. Cause a lot of people are like, well, what is my purpose? And I, I will say right now is that, so a lot of people will, will think if they're like in a job or something is that, wow, I'm, I'm not really feeling at work is that I got to leave because I got to find my purpose. No, I've coached some people who are in jobs that they're very good at and helping them to make things a little bit happier, but um, a lot of their needs are being met there. But I'm saying, okay, maybe it's going to be in your downtime, in your free time in which you volunteer somewhere. I, I'm truly a believer that our purpose is aligned with service to others. So it's, it's sharing our talents, it's sharing our gifts with people. So here's where we go to a place of minimizing ourselves because we all have gifts. We all have talents. And for someone who might be, it might be Maureen right now, who's thinking like, what are my gifts and talents? I'm going to tell you right now, you know what they are. You're just minimizing them. Now through more exploration, can we find more gifts and talents? Absolutely. But those gifts and talents that you have now, who could these help? And in what form, again, I'm not saying to leave your job, but that's what might be on the table right now is to say, hey, you know what? I have an opportunity to live my purpose. And I connect passion to it too, because normally when we're in our purpose, there's passion, there's this, this, this desire, this burning desire to want to do more of it. So I'm going to say, like, explore those things, those talents that you have that maybe you've cultivated into skills. And then ask yourself, hmm, who could they best serve right now? What population? Maybe it's elderly people. Maybe it's men. Maybe it's women. Maybe it's little kids. Maybe it's moms. Maybe it's dads. How could these enhance the quality of life for maybe, just maybe, this is where we got to kind of put our microscopes on, maybe just this target group for starters. And then if we want to to expand beyond that. But there's not one person on this phone call who doesn't have a talent, or I'm going to say many talents. The challenge is you are minimizing that. And I'll say it again, is that how easy is it for us to notice talent in another person? Like, wow, that was an amazing piano piece you just played. And even the way someone looks, you are so handsome, or you are gorgeous, or oh my, you're brilliant. But yet, if someone were to say that to you, you're brilliant. Huh? Wow, you're so beautiful or handsome. Ah, thanks a lot. You're so talented. Really? Why, folks? This is where we got to, like, take this, uh, like, free ourselves from these blockades, from these barriers we put on, on ourselves. Because I'm saying for every, all that greatness, all that wonderfulness, all that that you see in another person. Start to turn that yourself on to that because you deserve every single 
part of that. It's not something that needs to be achieved. Right now, for doing this thing called being a human being, is that you are deserving of living your life to the fullest with purpose, with passion, and everything else. And all this fear and failure and everything else, it's going to come along for the ride as well. And I'm going to tell you, there's so much that we can learn from it. And we have learned from it. Folks, even, and again, I didn't want to put a lot of emphasis on this pandemic, but it's the elephant in the room. It's front and center. You know what I find amazing about this? Is that while like things are starting to get a little better, people are getting out a little bit more. So do you realize in a, about a year, maybe even less, but let's just say a year, there are going to be challenges that surface in our lives. And what's going to happen is that we're going to have an opportunity to say, oh, I don't think I can get through this. Or we can actually make a choice to say, wait a minute, not only did I get through this pandemic, not only did I survive it, but I thrived in the face of it. See, I, I have the pandemic and we're going to realize and we're, it's going to be one of those things front and center. We're going to be like, do you remember that pandemic from 2020 and 2021? We're going to be talking about that. Right now, it's like, oh, it's so frustrating and everything. But look back, folks. Nothing compares to this pandemic. But if you go back in time, I'm telling you, you have a resilience. You have a resume of obstacles that you have overcome, not to be compared to. But I'm letting you know, you've had loss in your life and you've gotten stronger because of it. Now you're going to have a pandemic under your belt and I'm going to let you know that there's still an opportunity to thrive, still an opportunity to thrive. Right. Oh, it's 801. I know. I know. know. I was just going to say, I didn't see another question come through just yet. And I was like, that's actually the perfect way to end tonight, I think. So Jamie, didn't we say 8 a.m.? (laughs) <laughs> oh no i'm sorry that's that's a day of giving that's 24 hours yes that's 24 hours <laughs> this was amazing thank you so much you know we've gotten some great messages in the chat to me just thanking you for your time this evening and how inspiring you were and how everyone just feels so inspired after hearing from you so we really appreciate it on behalf of seton hall's alumni engagement and philanthropy department and for you to be he- here with us so thank you so much um, and thank you to everyone who attended tonight so we always love to see our alumni get together for for our virtual events or our in-person events when we get back there so um, we just want to thank everyone And um, we hope to see you all soon. And Scott, we hope to see you soon in person and have you on campus with us at some time at some event soon. So thank you again. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie and Meredith and Sean. You guys were wonderful. And everyone who just stayed on um, the the whole time. And I'm just really going to say you have the power within you to make some choices, different choices, if you want to make some changes you gotta put it into action. If not, they're just words that I shared with you tonight. Take these words, put them into action, then call me. Let's have lunch. Let's have dinner. Let's do whatever and tell me all about this greatness that you've created in your life starting today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you, everybody. Bye.